Well, this is what I have learned over the years. When you have to give a disclaimer about something that you're going to talk about, there's going to be conflict and there's going to be confrontation. So I just want you to know this morning as we begin to talk about the subject about renewing our minds, not, yes, last week we talked about taking off the old. Today we're going to talk about putting on the new. And you're going to hear me say some things that are going to kind of rub against the grain a little bit. And I know that up front. But all I'm asking for you to do is to hear me all the way through today. Let the Lord speak into your heart today and let him give you truth. Not just what I say, but what the word of God says today. Well, guess what? We are almost at the end of this series. We've been working on your character. Now, we've got a long ways to go. As I look around, I can tell we've got a lot of work to do. And as you're looking at me, you know that i got a lot of work to do. But we can take what we've learned over these last four weeks and what we're going to apply today and how we're going to challenge ourselves, challenge myself next week to go even deeper beyond the series. Because it's not just about getting through the series and learning something. It's about applying what we have learned and let it take and go with us throughout the days to come. And you might have already been getting tired of it. I understand if you have, but we've been talking about this thing of character. And we have said that character is the will to do what is right as God defines right, no matter what the cost. And that's hard to do. It's not always easy when you find yourself in a place that you really, really want it, but you know God's will is not for you to do that. But we go ahead and we find ourselves doing it anyway. And one of the hardest things that I have learned over my life is this, is that I always find myself getting to that same spot over and over again, dealing with those same issues over and over again. You and I, we love character, don't we? We love character and everybody else. We love character in the people that we live with. We love character in the people that we work with. We love character in the people that we associate with. But when it comes to character in ourselves, it's a little different, isn't it? When it comes to our character, we're a little bit more comfortable. We're a little bit more at ease to kind of say, well, I don't have to do that. I expect it from others, but I, do I really have to do that? So we're going to talk about this morning, this issue, this problem. This problem of character, because if you think back on your life, you think about all the things each and every time that you kind of butt up against it. Every time you get to that hill, every time you get to that wall, you just kind of fall short every single time. And the problem is that we just don't have the will to deal with it. And we've said about this already that aren't you glad that you serve a God who's so smart and so wise? Aren't you glad today that you and I serve a God who says it's, he knows that it's going to be about more than just him saying stop that? or do better, or work harder. He understands that there's something that needs to take place in our lives beyond that point of salvation where he begins to renew our minds, and he knows that once he begins to do that process and we allow him to do that, that we'll be changed forever. In fact, renewal, as we've talked about, breaks down the resistance, and he, that's what God knows about you and I. He knows that there are things in our past that we've struggled with. There are things that we have begun to believe as truth in our past that we have to deal with that are not accurate, that are not truths. And he knows that if we allow ourselves, if we abide in him, if we remain in him, there's a process that begins to work in our lives where it's not just a change of heart, but he begins to help us to think differently. And when we begin to think differently, you know what happens? We no longer resist those things when they come up into us. When those things that we know that we ought not to do, but we do it anyway. And it's in those moments that when he renews our mind, now we agree, we're in agreement with. We're able, as we talked about a few weeks ago, we're able to test and approve the very truth of God's word. And then now it's not just because he says don't do it. It's because we know we shouldn't do it. And we don't want to do it. And it's a process that he works through in our hearts and specifically in our minds. Now this is the promise, by the way. The promise is that scripture gives us an answer to those walls that you face, those struggles that, that you go through. And it's all because he wants to transform you into his likeness. He knows you can't do it on your own. He knows I can't do it on my own. And that's why we're going to be talking about what we are today. Today, we're, we're talking about the second half of this process. I know I already said it earlier. We talked last week about how we take off the old. Remember last week we said one of the struggles that we have about taking off the old is that, that we fall for lies that allow us to fall into bondage over the things that we do. Things like, I can't help it. Or things like, everybody else does it. Things like, you know, I, but I love her. 
And we talked about all those lies that we kind of fall into that allow us to just continue to do those same wrong things over and over and over again. So today what we're going to do is we're going to take that next step and we're going to talk about putting on the new. Up front, I'm going to give you some, some understanding about what's going to happen today. Something that I just am going to assume, I pray not, but I assume that this is going to happen at the end of our time together. There are some of you who are here today and you're going to listen to what I have to say today. You're going to be intent about listening to what I have to say. And at the end of the day, you're going to say, you know what, Pastor Dave, that makes a lot of sense but it's just too hard. You're going to say, Pastor, I understand what you're saying. I have no doubt about what you're saying. But quite honestly, for me, and what I'm about right now, and what I'm up to right now in my life, Pastor, it's just too stinking hard. And I can't do it. And this is what I promise you is this. All of you are going to go back, and you're going to continue to do what you've always done. You're going to fall back into those same things that you've always fallen back in. And guess what? You're going to use the same method of dealing with that as you always have. And it's going to produce in you the same results. That's what you can look forward to. What I'm asking you today and challenge you today is to look at this from a whole new perspective. Let me tell you what I think that 90% or maybe even more of you are going to resort back to. This is where you're going to start to feel the rub. You're going to resort back to prayer. And you're going to say, well, wait a minute, pastor. Time out. What are you saying? Are you saying I shouldn't be praying about this? Are you saying that those struggles that I have in my life, that I don't pray about it? No, not saying that. Don't ever think that your pastor doesn't believe in the power of prayer. He does. But I want to tell you this morning that sometimes we have taken things that God has given us and we use for a prescription for something that it was never intended to be for. Can I just give you an example of that this morning? This little thing right here is a beautiful tool, isn't it? Be quite honest with you, I don't use it very much, as many of you well know. But you know, I know what this tool is used for. If I want to put a nail into a piece of wood, man, this is a great tool for that. If I want to break some acorn banks, flip it in the air, grab it, and touch it down and hit the bank, you know what, that's really good for that, if I, if I follow through properly. But you know what, what if I want to drill a hole? How good is this tool for that? You ever tried to drill a hole with a hammer? It doesn't work, does it? Can I suggest to you this morning the same applies to the way that you and I deal with the, the areas of character in our life? That all our lives, most, most of our lives, let me suggest to you today, that you've been using this wrong tool for the wrong job. You've been using a tool that doesn't work. And I want to tell you this morning, as we look at an example through Jesus' life, you're going to find that Jesus gives us an example, maybe more, one of the most purest models that there is in Scripture on how to deal with this issue of character. So what I'm asking you to do is to not to take your tool that you've been using and throw it out as if it's useless, but I want you to use it for what it's intended to be. And I want you to think about the tool that we need to use so that when we meet that wall, we come up to that temptation, that struggle that we have in our character over and over again, that we start using the right tool that will forever change you. Can I pray for you this morning as we get started today? Let's pray together. Father, this morning we come to you right now, and Lord, we know <laughs> that, that a lot of us, we, we revert back to prayer. And there's nothing wrong with prayer. But I pray that even today, Lord, that you would just begin to speak into our hearts and give us understanding about what, Lord, we need to do to put on the new. Lord, that we would seek your word and not our hearts for answers. We wouldn't just listen to Pastor Dave today, but we would listen to your word. Lord, that it may speak to us in a powerful, powerful way, and we'll know and not be able to deny, Lord, that you've just spoken to us today. Lord, I ask it in the precious and the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. You know, I tell you, I got to say this, this, is, this happens all the time. I have people come into my office and, and people say, you know, I'm struggling with this. This is an area of my life. And you know, I ask them right up front, have you been praying about it? And of course they've been praying about it. You, you think about your lives. Think about the struggles that you faced in your life. Did you not pray about it? I mean, of all the things that we do, the one thing we always do is we pray about it. And I don't know how your prayer life goes, but it's kind of like this for me. You know, I go into it, it's like, God, I know I shouldn't, but I, I, I do it anyway. Lord, help me, Lord, help me. And you know what I find myself doing? I still do it anyway. 
And I come back to that spot again in my life, and I'm at that same spot again. Lord, Lord, I please, please, please help me, Lord. But did you pray about it? Sure, I prayed about it. And so have you. But there is something that takes place, that can take place if we allow it to. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. Let me just define what this is about, okay, just so that we're clear. Renewal of the mind changes our character. The renewal of our mind changes character. And if you're just taking notes this morning, please just write that down as the very first thing that you remember. The renewal of our minds changes our character. Do we pray for things? Sir, sure we pray for things. Are there things that God calls us to pray for? Absolutely he does. But let me say to you this morning that it is renewal of our minds that changes character. Let me kind of define this for you as we kind of look at this together. What does that mean uh, for you and for me? It means to, this whole issue is to learn to counter that specific lie with a specific truth in God's word. There are lies that you and I fall for over and over again, and you and I have to counter that with the truth of what God's word says about that lie. And we have to know it. It has to be on our tongue so that in those moments we proclaim it with the very stronghold of God's word, that which is stronger than a two-edged sword. That's what I want to talk to you about today. Some of you are in bondage today. And you wouldn't say that you're in bondage, but you are. And I just wrote down just a few areas that I think that, that applies to so many people. Some of you have been taught as a child of wrong thinking, and it, has, and it has made you who you are today. It's caused you to think the way that you think today. And it all might be because you were told as a young person that you weren't worthy enough, that you weren't good enough, and it has dictated to you the way that you think about things. For some of you, it's the way that you were raised in a church. For some of you, the way that you were taught about who God is it could, be, could vary in many, many different ways. For some of you, you look at God as nothing more than a a, a man with a sword who just waits for you to fall short so that he can wipe you off. And for others of you, you've looked at God as like almost like a Santa Claus, that he just, whatever you want, you get. You wish for it, you got it. You have all these wrong perspectives about who God is. For some of you, you have looked at life and you've you've been influenced by friends who've taught you things that are not true, and you buy into that today. You are influenced by this world and what the world says is truth and your influence is now built upon that and that is now why you believe what you believe. But I want you to know that as we said last week that this whole issue as we talked about this identity of those things is so important that you and I deal with that and we don't fall for those lies. But the way to make progress, the way that you and I make progress is to strip away the old and put on the new. And I want you to know how we do that today. We need to saturate those lies with the truth toward those lies. And that means to go further. By the way, can I just talk to you? This is the guilty part. It goes further than just you and me reading three chapters in God's word to say that we read three chapters in God's word. For some of you, the reading of God's word is just to get through a chapter. For some of you, it's just about being able to say that you read through the Bible in a year. And by the way, can I applaud you today if that's what you're in the progress of doing? I commend you for that. But can I say to you this morning that it goes beyond even that. It requires more than that. It requires you, it requires you and I to dig deep and be committed to get this to memorizing God's word. Memorizing it so that we have that word at the tip of our tongues so that in the very moment that you and I struggle, we can, we can proclaim it as what it is, as truth. Let me tell you, you know what truth does? The truth will what? Set you free. Did you ever hear anybody say that prayer will set you free? Truth will set you free. That's what we're going to talk about today. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to make this really clear to you today. May I suggest to you as we get started, and we're going to kind of really get into this deep right now. There's probably only one other model in all of Scripture that could be more clear than what this model is. And I'm going to suggest it's in the moment when the disciples ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. And then he gives us a specific prayer. He teaches us how to pray. May I suggest that maybe this is the second most clearest model that there is in Scripture. And it's Jesus talking about how you and I deal with character and temptation and what molds you and what makes you and me.
That's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have your Bibles, here's what we're going to see today. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4 with me today, if you would. Matthew chapter 4. Yes, as soon as I say Matthew chapter 4, many of you, because you've been studying God's Word for a long, long time, say, oh, I know all about that one. That's Jesus' temptation. I remember that one. I want you to know this morning that we're going to find out that Jesus gives you and he gives me the clearest, most deliberate answer to the question of how we put on the new. That's what we're going to talk about right now. So Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, this is what it says. Then Jesus was led. I want you to catch this. This is very important. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. So he is being led by the Spirit of God into the desert to be tempted by the evil one. After fasting 40 days, please don't blow by that, it would take the Spirit of God to tell me to fast for 40 days. Can I just have, this might be the only amen I'm going to hear today, but would anybody say amen to that this morning? Remember that, it's the only one we're going to hear today. Over a month, he is in the desert. Over a month, he does not eat. <laughs> and I think one of the most, well, one of the most craziest statements in the whole scripture is what we read next. He was hungry. <laughs> well, I bet he was. I have this gut feeling that maybe, just maybe, he was a little hungry. Now, I want you to now look at these temptations that Satan gives to Jesus. And I want you to see what Jesus does in response to those temptations. And it's all about character. Listen carefully. It's not just a temptation. It's about developing the wrong kind of character. Verse 3. The tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, stop right there and remember that. He says, look, see all these stones? If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. All these three temptations are for a purpose. And the purpose is this, is for Jesus in some way to misuse the powers that he has been given. Satan knows that he is the son of God. There's no question about what Satan knows about Jesus. He knows that he's the son of God. But he wanted him to use his power outside of the boundaries in which the heavenly father had asked him to do it. That's what we're going to find out about all three of these temptations. And I want you to just see what happens. Did you know that there was a lie in every single one of these temptations? Now go back. Look at it again. You, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Do you want to know what the lie is this morning? Here's the lie. Jesus, catch this. Jesus, you have the right to meet your own needs regardless what the Father has led you to do. You have the right. And doesn't that just happen to all of us? Don't all of us find ourselves at some point when it comes to our character that we just feel like that some way, somehow, we have the right? We have the right to be outside of God's will, to be our own person? That we have the right to, to meet our own needs if we want to? I mean, God, I know that there's things that you want me to do in life, but there's some things I need. I'm hungry. And isn't it right for me to be able to fulfill those needs as I want? That's what Satan is telling Jesus. But I want you to look at the response of Jesus. You know what he did next? He bowed his head and he prayed. Is that what your Bible says? Nope, neither does mine. This is what the Bible says. Jesus answered. And understand that before I read the rest of this, this passage here, Jesus could have done anything he wanted to at this point. He could have done absolutely anything he wanted to. But this is what he does. Jesus answered. It is written. When he says it is written, do you know what Jesus is now doing? He's proclaiming the gospel to Satan. He is, he is speaking verses from the word of God. And he says this. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's countered the specific lie with a specific truth from God's word. Do you know how comforting it is in those moments when you are face to face with the temptation that you're going through and right then, right now, you have a verse to combat that. Now some of you are saying, oh, it's just words. Pastor, it's just, like, it's just like something else on a page. Is that really that big of a deal? Let me tell you, you don't understand the power of God's word then. Because that is the truth. It is the thing that sets you free. And it's at your disposal if you so choose. 
Jesus felt that this was so important to respond this way for a specific reason. And, and in light of all that, doesn't that just, is it any wonder that we fall short? Is it any wonder that we don't fall short in the temptations and the areas of our character? Because what do we do? So we pray. And we ask God, God, please, please help me. I know I shouldn't, but I'm going to. I know I shouldn't, but I do it anyway. Jesus said there's something more important. There's something more important than just meeting my needs. There's something more important than just me meeting my needs. It's obeying my heavenly Father. I sure want to eat. I bet Jesus said, yeah, I'm hungry. I'm starving here. But you know what it is for him? Obedience was more important to Jesus than meeting his own needs. Can you write that down? Obedience is more important than meeting his own needs. Jesus knew that. And it's important for you and I to know that too. Obedience is far more important for us than just you and I meeting our own desires, our own wants. But you know what? Satan's pretty smart. Let's give him a little credit this morning. Because you know what he does next? He takes a little page out of the playbook of what Jesus just did. I want you to look at the next temptation. This is what he says next. Look at verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, and again, he knows he's the son of God. He said, throw yourself down and catch what Satan does. You look what he does. He starts using scripture too. He's not stupid. He says, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You know what the lie is there? Say, you know what, Jesus? You need to prove yourself. You know what, Jesus? I know you're sent from God and all that, but you've got, you got something about you too. You've got a reputation. Let people know who you are too. You might have been sent by God, but you're your own man. And you can do this if you want because you're in control. You know, everyone is, I think everyone is in their, in their character is challenged regarding our reputation. It's all about reputation. You know, I, I wrote these down because of the things that we're going through in our society today. It was so easy to come up with a list of things. And I just want to throw these out to you this morning. You know, you and I are so concerned about our reputations, about what other people think about us. Just like Satan is saying to Jesus, you know, you know Jesus, you, know, you need to have your own reputation. You need to do it on your own. You don't, need to, you don't need to have God do it for you. You do it for yourself. Prove to people who you are. You're your own man. Well, let me tell you what I think we go through in our lives every day. For some of you, you think about men, for example. If you're really a man, you would own fill in the blank. You get pushed and prodded and tempted all the time to have that reputation of the, of the person who has this or has done that. If you were really successful, you would have this in your life. And we try so hard because we want people to see us in the right way. And we work at it. We try so hard to accommodate those things. If you were really a woman of today, would you really stay at home like you do? If you were, I mean, are you just going to stay at home, take care of the kids? Is that all your life is worthy of? That's what you and I are told. It's not very worthy to stay at home and watch your kids and raise your kids, is it? <laughs> Isn't that crazy, the lies that we fall for every single day? Look at what Jesus does. He doesn't pray. He doesn't get into a long, drug-out argument. You ever find yourself getting to that point? <laughs> you get aggravated about things, and you, and you think, I don't understand why it's happening that way, and I just, I want to fight about it. I want to argue about it. Sometimes I just want to pray about it. But look at what Jesus does. Jesus answered him. It is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Would you please just write this down, these next few words that I'm about to tell you? Obedience takes precedent over recognition. Obedience takes precedent over recognition. Jesus says, sure, I want people to know who I am, but that's not the driving force in my life. Sure, I want people to know who I am, but I'm here to obey the Father. That's what Jesus says. And we could all tell our story, couldn't we? Just like Jesus stands there and he says what he did, we could all sit there and tell our story. I so desperately needed to prove who I was, so I went out and I worked hard at it and I got this. I bought the thing that I was working so hard to get. 
and I take it home, I don't get the response that I thought, and I'm laying in bed at night, and I look at myself, and I'm thinking, man, I'm so stupid. Why did, why did I do that? Why, why, did I, why did I feel like I had to do that? And then you go out the next day, and, and you go to the people that you thought you were trying to impress, and they're not even watching anyway. And we thought they were watching all along. And we feel so silly about it. Folks, it's so important that we understand what we're about and who we are and what we're here for. And we tell our own story. We work so hard to accomplish those things. And what does it give us? What does it produce in us? So he gives us the third. And and look at what happens. Again, verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And their splendor. All this, he says, I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. You know what most theologians say about this passage of scripture right here? Most theologians say about this scripture right here is that what Satan was doing was offering him a shortcut. Some way, somehow, Satan, through some mystical way, shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, all the splendor of the world, And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want want you to just do one thing for me. I want to offer you a shortcut. All you have to do is this. Look around. You see these things that I'm showing you? See all this splendor? Aren't these the people that you came for? Aren't, Aren't these the people that you want to recognize you as Lord and Savior? Of course they are. But you know what the lie is? The lie is what I just said. You can bypass the cross. You can bypass the cross if you want. But here's the only thing you got to do. You just got to make one little compromise. For just a moment, I want you to turn away from God for just a moment, and I want you to bow a knee to me. Just for a moment. All I want is one moment of your devotion. That's all. I want you to turn from the Father for just one moment. For this one little tiny compromise, and then it's all yours. You know what the, another lie is about that? Not only can you bypass the cross, but you can have your cake and eat it too. That's what it says to you and me. You know what? In those moments when you look at that situation that's in front of you and you say to yourself, you know what? But just for a minute, let me just come here for just one minute. Let me do my thing right here and I'll come right back. Just, I, I'm not going to run from him. I'm not going to leave him forever. I'm just going to take one minute out of my time. I'm going to take one little season. I'm going to take one little night. I'm going to take one little day. I'm going to take one little hour for me. And Lord, I'll come back. And let me tell you, that's a lie from the pit of hell. I want you to look at Jesus' response. Verse 10. What does he do again? He quotes scripture again. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You, I, I know I've asked you to write down a lot of things, but can I ask you to write this? This is the last thing. I want you to write this down. I wrote this down for me. It's, like, it's almost like a sub uh, point in my, in my scripture. And I wanted it to be just a reminder to me as it was what Jesus was saying to Satan. And here it is. Nothing I gain. Please write this down. Nothing I gain through broken relationship or broken fellowship with the Father is worth having. Can you hear me with that again? There's nothing that I gain through broken fellowship with the Father that is worth having. Do you understand what I'm saying? Here's the thing. Jesus says, there is nothing in this world that is worth its weight in gold because I break relationship with him. There is nothing that is good enough for me to have that's worth breaking my relationship with the Heavenly Father. So when you think about that struggle, and you think about that something, let that be a reminder to you that I'm to worship the Lord your God with all your heart and to serve him only. Nothing else, at any time, even for a moment, nothing. Can I just ask you this morning, are you willing to take the time? Are you willing to take the time to do more than just read your Bible? Are you willing to take the time to, to, to go deeper than that, to say, not only am I going to read it, but I am going to put it to memory so that in those moments there are so sp- specific verses of truth 
that combat the specific lies that I deal with every time my character is challenged, every time I go through that struggle or that temptation, I can have strength in that moment. I can have the truth in that moment that sets me free. And it requires more than just reading. It's about memorizing the word of God. Men, are there any of you who are here today who have in your heart or memorized or something that you can speak out loud that says it is written? Is it written when you go to that hotel room, when you're traveling and you go and you lock the door and you look at that piece of paper that's on the TV and you got the channel guide right there before you and you know those channels that you ought not to surf on, but you surf them anyway. In those moments, do you have a, there is, it is written to combat the lie that Satan says, no one's going to know. No one's going to find out. I'm only going to do it just one time. That's all. Do you have a, it is written? Ladies, are there some of you who are here today who would say, you know, when it comes to the credit card and it's screaming at you, is there a, it is written to say that this is wrong? In those moments when you're, when you're already maxed out, when you're lonely and you're mad and you're aggravated and you're, just, you're at a place where you're just trying to do something to combat the struggle that you're going through and maybe going out and spending a little bit more makes you feel a little bit better about the situation? Is there a something in your heart or on the tip of your tongue that says it is written to combat that, that struggle? Kids, is there something, youth, is there something that is on the tip of your tongue that it is written that even though you know that your parents, you're supposed to obey your parents, they're not always right, but is there a written on your tongue that says, but I will obey them? Because it's the biblical thing, it's the truth. You know how many years, and I know the praise team is going to be coming back, but do you know how many years I spent of my life did not seeing the value in memorizing God's word? I grew up in a church that it really wasn't at the forefront. It wasn't something that was pushed on us. It wasn't something that people said, you should do this. Now, you know, for so many years, I spent time, you know, I'd read a passage of Scripture, and I would kind of have the, I'd have knowledge about what the story was about. But do you know how powerful it is in those moments to, to cry out and say, but it is written in those moments when I'm tempted to not allow the lie to fester? so that I can combat that with greater power and strength than I have in my own will, beyond my will, because I've abided and I have remained in him. Not anything else. I have the word of God to stand on, and I know, as I said a moment ago, Pastor, it sounds good, but it's too much. Let me tell you, you can't live without it. And I'm promising you, you'll go back to the same thing you've always done. And if I get an email this week, I'll still read it. I don't deny the power of prayer. But there's very few times I've ever heard anybody say, you know, this pornography issue that I got, I prayed about it and everything's great now. There is a renewing in our minds. And the power of prayer is the power of prayer. But you need to know that the truth of God will set you free. I'm not saying that you can memorize scripture as a non-Christian and have power in that. I'm telling you though, that when you trust him and you abide in him, use prayer for what it was intended to be, but let God renew your mind so you can begin to do and become all that he's called you to be. Wouldn't that be great to finally face those battles, those character issues in your life and know that as soon as it comes before you, just like that, you got truth and you can proclaim it. I don't normally talk about the message that's coming up, but I'm just gonna tell you what's gonna happen next week. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill you with so much scripture next week, it's gonna be like a hydrant, you know, filling up your mouth, trying to get a drink. And, and here's what's gonna happen. For the next 10, 10 weeks or so, I'm gonna put a, a verse in, in the bulletin, a verse for, that I'm gonna challenge you, challenge me to memorize those areas that so often happen for you and for me, those struggles and temptations, those character flaws that you and I have, there are gonna be verses I'm gonna throw out to you that I pray that you'll just take one verse, once a week, take one verse and memorize it so that the next time, the next battle will not have the same result as the last battle and you'll find victory.
I promise you. Trust in him. Trust in his word. And it will change you forever. I'd like to ask that you stand this morning as, as we do. We're going to sing to him today. And some of you are saying, Pastor, I already feel it. I'm not denying it, but when I leave here today, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. I'm not even going to talk about it with my wife, my husband. We're not going to talk about it because if we talk about it, we might be convicted to do something about it. So here's what I want to challenge you to do today. I want you to do more than just talk about it. I want you to proclaim right here, right now, where you stand with your spouse. And you probably are going to need your spouse. You might just need your whole stinking family to do it together. By the way, your family's not stinking. I looked right at you and I said stinking, didn't I? I didn't mean that. We won't see them next week. Uh, I've already cut them down. I love that family. Um, But can I tell you today, folks, it may be the most powerful thing you'll ever do in your life. Do it together as a family. But do it together as a family because it'll change your family. And it'll change you. And if you want to make a bold statement today, I don't think there's anything wrong for you as a family to stand before yourself right here in the pew or right here at this altar. And you go before the Lord today not to pray for help, although you can, but to proclaim to him today, Lord, I stand before you today and I put this at the altar saying, I will. I will commit this to my heart. I'll commit this to my memory. And I don't want to just memorize to memorize. I want to memorize to have truth so when those moments come, I have victory. I pray that you'll do that. And if you want to pray here, you can. If you want to pray right there where you are, but make it known to your spouse, make it known to your family today that we will stand on the word of God. Let's pray together this morning. Father, you're a good God and we love you today. Would you hear our cry this morning? Would you hear our cry as we proclaim to you today, Lord, we give all of ourselves to you. Let's sing together this morning, shall we? Let's praise him today for who he is. Father, lead us from this place today with your spirit that speaks to our hearts. Lord, may our hearts long today to run to you, to stay close to you, to abide with you, that we hunger for that every day, that we would take your word and we do more than just accomplish the the goal of reading a chapter. Lord, we would accomplish the goal of putting your word to our minds. And that as we continue in that process, our minds and our character will be changed. Because you'll renew our thoughts and our minds to those old ways of thinking. And we can stand on a foundation that is sure and is strong. That we will not waver, we will not fall because of the blowing of the wind. But on your foundation your strength alone. Father, we love you today. We pray that you would just open our hearts, clear our minds, and Lord, may those excuses of things like, I can't memorize. Lord, may we set those fears aside and just take one verse at a time. For as long as it takes to remember 12 words, may we do so. Because it will be our strength in our deepest and darkest hours. Lord, we thank you today for the confidence that we can have in the word that has been the foundation and the backbone of who we are. And it is for us you have given it. And for that we praise you today. It's in your precious and your wonderful name that we pray. And all God's people said, God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. And don't splash Gatorade on the way out.